just want to tell you a little bit about the town of East Pokeberry. East Pokeberry is a small town in North Carolina you've probably never heard of because it's tiny and out of the way and unremarkable in all the ways that we would normally judge a place to be worthy of remark. Where is it? It's to the left of Chapel Hill, geographically, and to the right of Charlotte, socially and politically. Your GPS isn't much help in finding East Pokeberry. You can't get there without getting good and lost on back roads and, more importantly, putting yourself into a state of mind that allows you to notice what happens in a place where nothing ever happens and to appreciate the stories from a place where nothing ever changes. East Pokeberry has the distinction of being North Carolina's least quaint small town, a town utterly lacking in charm. Miraculously, the bank on Main Street somehow hasn't closed yet, which means it hasn't been renovated and reopened as an upscale art gallery, selling expensive paintings of quaint downtowns of small country towns. And miraculously, the Methodist Church still hasn't shuttered, shuttered its doors, which means, it's, means it hasn't been renovated and turned into an art house cinema, showing French films about existential ennui. East Pokeberry is a town with enough existential ennui to go around. East Pokeberry may, in fact, have the distinction of being the only town in North Carolina not to have its own microbrewery, <laughs> which means that life in this town is a sobering proposition. Snobbery, pretense, and highbrow sophistication are attitudes that will keep you from learning the lessons this town has to teach. And so you may be wondering, how is it that I decided to visit the town of East Pokeberry yesterday when I should have been writing a sermon for you instead? True story, back when I served a church in Kansas, I used to sneak away to the town of Holmes Prairie out there on the Kansas Prairie. And there I became something of a friend of a man named Frank Rodden, the town curmudgeon, and when I told him that I'd be leaving for Chapel Hill, Frank's eyes lit up and he told me that I'd have to take a road trip over to East Pokeberry and meet his cousin Hank. So the blur of interstate gave way to Blue Highway. Fast food chains and billboards disappeared in the rearview mirror. As the road shed lanes and narrowed, the wild foliage and viney undergrowth made the trip feel claustrophobic only to open again into vistas of fields demarcated by weathered fence posts and rusted wire. Eventually, the, rind, the winding road, with signs mostly covered by creeping vines, emptied out on an old main street with faded storefronts bleached by the bright North Carolina sun. I pulled into an empty spot in front of Lucy's pie shop and headed inside, where Hank loitered sitting on a chair with vinyl covering at a Formichael table holding a blue plate full of crumbs and a mug with a swill of coffee left in it. Try the banana cream pie, ordered Hank, best in all the state. But watch out for the coffee. It's not like that boutique gourmet roasted stuff they serve in Chapel Hill. I've seen towns around here with tap water stronger than the stuff Lucy serves. I was still in the middle of my first bite of the best banana cream pie in all the state when we were interrupted by a great big hello calling out across the pie shop. In bustled a woman with gray hair, sensible shoes, and a smile as bright as the yellow standing on the side of love t-shirt she was wearing. She called out to her, us, I heard the new UU minister from Chapel Hill was dropping by and I just had to stop by and say hello. Turning to Lucy, she snapped, no coffee for me, unless you've acted on that free trade coffee petition we sent you. Hank stood up and said, let me introduce you to Mildred Polk. Ms. Polk is the president of the Universalist Church of East Pokeberry. As we visited, I learned that there was, in fact, a Universalist Church in town, that it dates back nearly two centuries, one of those rare rural Universalist churches still holding on. This one had dwindled to a specter of its former glory, but it was still tenaciously holding on. You'd think with only 12 members it would be on life support. But that's not the case. It's a church with 12 members and an 11-person board of trustees. <laughs> it can't be a 12-member board, Mildred told me. We need to have a tie-breaking vote. 
and believe me, we've needed it. I also learned from Mildred that the church boasts 10 committees <laughs> and a nine-member bluegrass band. Like the town of East Polkbury, many of those old rural universalist churches have fallen on hard times, those that haven't shuttered their doors entirely, that is. I just don't get it, puzzled Mildred. You'd think most people would want to be Unitarian Universalist if only they knew what we were about. Hank the curmudgeon responded wryly, look at the world. Love and acceptance and mercy and redemption are losing business propositions, don't you know? You should spice up your message with a bit of hate and fear and greed and watch the pews and the collection plates fill up. Enough of that cynicism, Mildred scowled. Who wants another piece of pie, I asked, trying to keep the peace. And so our conversation continued through the afternoon when a preoccupied-looking gentleman ambled aimlessly by the plate window looking out on the Main Street sidewalk. Hank jumped up from the table and rapped on the window, startling the man from his wandering. Hey, Izzy, come in, Hank hollered. Turning to me, Hank said, let me introduce you to Izzy, I mean the Reverend Ishmael Jacobs. He's the longtime pastor of the First Baptist Church of East Pokeberry. Izzy, you've served there for, what, 25 years? 27, but who's counting, the pastor replied, and please call me Ishmael. It's like clockwork, Mildred explained, every Saturday afternoon, every single one. Izzy, I mean Reverend Jacobs, passes by, lost in his thoughts, full of dread and dismay about the next day's sermon. So, Pastor, what problem are you furrowing your brow over this week? Ishmael sighed, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. As I'm walking today, I'm wondering and uh, worrying over whether my words are making any difference. I've been preaching here across parts of four decades, telling them the good news about Jesus Christ and our Christian duty to, to our neighbors and strangers, instructing, instructing these people on how to live good lives, joyful and generous and humble and righteous. I'm wondering if my words ever changed anybody. I know it's not just my words, that it's, it's God's message, the power of the Word of God, but it seems to me that people keep struggling with the same stuff restlessness and temptation and bad choices. It seems like people don't change. And I'm tired. I'm tired after another catastrophe, another tragedy, another act of evil. A bombing in Oklahoma City, September 11th, marathon bombing, school shootings, Charleston. I know I'm preaching to just a small group of church folk here in East Pokeberry. But I know there are other pulpits, and I don't believe for a second that I have some special gift of preaching that those other preachers don't have. I've heard those preachers. I know they're telling the truth and speaking with bravest fire. But the world doesn't seem to be listening. It doesn't seem to be changing at any rate. How do you get people to change? My words sure seem like they're not doing the trick in any event. The look on the faces of Mildred and Hank told me that Reverend Ishmael wasn't like this every week before the sermon. I think there's another way to see it, Mildred answered optimistically after a few moments of silence. The way I see it, Mildred said, change is always happening. Slavery wasn't that long ago, and it wasn't that long ago that women didn't have the right to vote. Look what we're seeing with gay marriage, and there's been even a, a widespread acceptance of Caitlyn Jenner. That's change. Change. I guess I see it that way because we Unitarian Universalists are the religion of change. We're always open to new wisdom and new revelation, the teachings of science and reason and all that. Talk about change. I've seen UUs go from theist to atheist to mystic, from Rastafarian to Pastafarian to gluten-free. We love change. It's something you can believe in. Now, Mildred, Hank interrupted, you're being too optimistic here. Be honest. For all this bragging about being open to change, didn't you sit at this table a couple of weeks ago and talk all that hubbub that got raised when a piece of furniture got moved to a new space over at your universalist church? 
or that time when you tried to change your chalice lighting words, or when you tried to increase pledges during the stewardship drive, or when you, I get the point, enough already, Mildred interrupted. But Hank continued, my point is that change is hard. Even the things that seem obvious or superficial or even completely unimportant in the grand scheme of things, whatever the change is, it's hard. If it were easy, it would have changed already. Can I get a word in here, I asked. So on Friday, I told them, on Friday I went to a, a vigil over at St. Paul's AME in Chapel Hill. My heart was breaking that day and I know I needed to be with other people in support and in grief. And I came early and I got seated next to a pastor from an African American Baptist church right up front. And we got to talking and he told me a story. He told me it was a true story, a story about a young racist man recruited as a teenager by David Duke himself, selected to be David Duke's protege, a future leader of the Klan. Pastor told me that one day this Klansman in training was passing through town and saw a black man eating at a restaurant and decided he was going to go in and start some trouble with that man. The boy walked in, walked up to the man in the middle of his meal, leaned in and told him with anger and viciousness, we're going to do to you what was done to that chicken on your plate. The man looked up, looked back at his plate, picked up the drumstick, puckered his lips and gave that drumstick a great big kiss. The young boy didn't even know what to do, but he left to go think about it. And I was told by the pastor that when he went to go think about it, that God reached down and changed his heart, and he went from burning crosses to believing in him. So that was the story that got told to me on Friday as I was sitting in that pew waiting for the service to start. And so I get what, what Reverend Ishmael is saying about the desire for our, for our words to bring about an epiphany. That's how I want it to be. I want it always to be a stroke of insight, a lightning bolt of new understanding, a sudden transformation. Those moments are sorely needed. And when they're true, they're beautiful, but they seem too few and far between right now. And I get what Mildred is saying about optimistically living in the expectation of change. And I get what Hank is saying about change happening slower than we can stand it. And with that, Reverend Jacob stood up and continued on his walk. So instead of writing a sermon this morning, I took a road trip and had two pieces, three pieces, <laughs> of the best banana cream pie in North Carolina. And even though I don't have a sermon for you, Izzy, I mean, Reverend Ishmael Jacobs, was kind enough to send me a copy of his sermon on the chance that a Unitarian Universalist preacher might be willing to read it. And since I have a little time to fill, I thought I might read just a little excerpt from the words that are being spoken this morning at that Baptist church in East Pokeberry, where Reverend Jacobs is saying, my friends, we know this past week brought us new horror, new sorrow. New horror and sorrow that are not at all new, but old and more of the same. In Charleston, a young man steeped in the lies of vicious racial hatred targeted an African-American church, killing nine beautiful souls. We know this wasn't the first time that horrors of violence were inflicted on Mother Emanuel. In the 1800s, the state of South Carolina sent 35 members of that church to the gallows and burned the church to the ground. 
And we know that, that these black churches in the South have been victimized over and over again by arson and bombings and sniper fire. When will it end? When will we change? Change is so slow. In this century, in this century, there was a public opinion poll in which white people were asked to comment on the state of racial equality in our country. 83% of whites say that blacks receive equal housing opportunities. 80% of whites say that blacks receive equal educational opportunities. 67% of whites believe that African Americans do not face racial bias from police. 6% of whites believe that racism, only 6% of whites believe that racism is a very serious problem for African Americans. That's compared with 12% who believe that Elvis is still alive. But the thing that's unfathomable, unfathomable is that when these same questions were asked 50 years ago, the responses were just about the same in 1962 before the Civil Rights Act, before the Voting Rights Act, when Jim Crow was still the law of the land, 84% of whites said that blacks have the same educational opportunity as whites. And 60% of whites believed that blacks were treated equally in their communities. In the Bible, we hear a lamentation for the lack of change in the world. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity, cries the teacher in Ecclesiastes. And in chapter 1, verse 9, he cries out, what has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. There is nothing new under the sun. But that's not the only word. In another book of the Bible, God proclaims through the prophet Isaiah, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Look, I am doing a new thing. So who's right and who's wrong? Is Ecclesiastes telling us the truth and Isaiah lying through his teeth? Or is Isaiah right and we should just take Ecclesiastes out of the Bible? What do we do when the two passages seem to contradict? Or could it be that they are both right in their own way? And so let us pray. Dear Lord, as we stand in thy presence, we wait here desperate for change and reluctant to change, awaiting change and fearing change. We long for those cool new waters to spring forth for a new path to be shown through the desert. And we wait under the hot sun, saying it's taking too long, it's taking too long. And so we stand there, not fully in the sun, not fully in the shade, but dappled taking, trying to find the courage to move out from what is to what will be. We stand there dappled. And the good news is that the Lord is a lover of dappled things. And so we ask for the courage to be better better than we are, as good as the world demands. Those, my friends, are the words being spoken this morning at the First Baptist Church in East Pokeberry. And that, my friends, is the news from East Pokeberry, a tiny town left of Chapel Hill, geographically, but to the right of Charlotte, in all ways. A small town going the way small towns are going, a place where nothing ever happens and nothing ever changes until you stop and look more closely and see what is happening. Amen.
So we began our service today with some, with some words about summer, and, and I want to end with some words about summer. Uh, tomorrow morning, I, I get on a plane for Portland, Oregon, to go to the Unitarian Universalist General Assembly, and so I offer you some, some words as an exaltation of summer and a, and a valediction to you for the month ahead. These words uh, are by a, a folk rock singer named Colin Malloy. He's uh, the front man of a, of a little band called the Decemberists. And this is uh, his beautiful words to June Hymn. Here's a hymn to welcome in the day, heralding a summer's early sway, and all the bulbs are coming in to begin. The thrushes, their bleeding battle with the wrens, disrupts my reverie. And pegging clothing on the line and training jasmine how to vine, up the arbor to your door and more. There's a barony of ivy in the trees, expanding out its empire by degrees, and all the branches burst abloom, into bloom. And heaven sent this cardinal maroon to decorate our living room. Once upon it, the yellow bonnets garland on the line, and you were waking and the day was breaking. A panoply of song. Summer comes to Springville Hill. Summer has come.